Okay, so picking up where we left off, renal, uh, renal disease, um, the largest population of transplant recipients are in need of a kidney. So the kidney is by far the most common organ that's transplanted. And what is the role of the kidney? It excretes um, nitrogenous waste. Um, it regulates fluid volume, composition, and acid-based balance of the blood. And then synthesis of hormones necessary for erythrocyte production, bone metabolism, and maintenance of blood pressure. So the kidneys are pretty darn important. Signs and symptoms of renal disease um, or kidney disease. Decreased urine output. Um, the volume may remain the same, but actual what the contents of the urine um, may be decreased. Hypertension, anemia, cardiovascular disease, fluid retention, edema in the legs, ankles, feet, fatigue, drowsiness and or confusion, shortness of breath, seizures or coma in severe cases, chest pain related to pericarditis, and then skin conditions. So the clinical manifestations are very long for chronic renal disease. We want to look over the table on um, in, in the fifth edition, it's table 54.1 to see all the body systems that can be affected because it's really a very long, um, a long list. And I'm not going to test you on a lot of that because that goes into great detail. The stages of kidney disease, uh, basically it has to do with the GFR. A lot of it has to do with the, the rate of the GFR, which is... Um, Glom glomular filtration rate and the most accurate means of measuring renal function is the glomular filtration rate and that is an expression of the quality of glomular um, filtrate creates each minute in the renal nephrons so it's the quality of the filtration essentially so renal stage one renal damage with normal GFR um, which is um, greater than 90 at or greater than 90 and then renal da and you might not have any symptoms here at stage one. Stage two, renal damage with mild decrease in the GFR, so it's a, a number between 60 to 89. Again, there may not be any major symptoms. Moderate, the GFR just keeps getting lower. Anemia and bone metabolism disorders become more um, common. Um, chronic kidney disease is defined by kidney damage or a GFR that's less than 60. Stage 4, severe reduction of GFR, 15 to 29. End stage or kidney failure, you're under 15 in the GFR. Um, risk factors for chronic kidney disease, adults with diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, obesity, and then a family history of car um, chronic kidney disease. <clears throat> So uh, systemic conditions, anemia or a lowered number of erythrocytes or blood re red blood cells causes fatigue and weakness, infections because of a weakened immune system, low calcium level and high phosphorus levels in the blood causing bone problems, high potassium level in the blood causing an irregular heartbeat or pulse, loss of appetite or reduction in food intake, Excess fluids in the body causing high blood pressure, swelling or edema in the legs and feet, shortness of breath because of fluid in the lungs, so pulmonary edema, depression or a lower quality of life, and then premature death likely due to heart disease and stroke. So chronic kidney disease affects many body systems, as you can see. So end-stage renal disease, so what is happening here, um, patients are on dialysis. Dialysis is a treatment method of cleaning and filtering waste and toxins from the blood when the kidneys um, lose function in end-stage renal disease. So it removes salts and extra water to prevent them from building up in the body, maintains a safe balance of certain chemicals in the pH, such as potassium, sodium, and bicarbonate, and it helps to control blood pressure. So that's what dialysis does. There's a couple different types of dialysis. There is hemodialysis, which is um, someone goes into a dialysis clinic and all their blood basically kind of filters through a machine and then goes back into their body. 
And then there is CAPD and CCPD, which is continual ambulatory peritoneal dialysis and continuous psych cyclic assisted peritoneal dialysis. Those, I believe, are um, almost methods that are done at home or with a, a caregiver. And they are, one is not considered superior. Um, they're just, depends on a patient's, um, basically like a, ba a patient's lifestyle and a, um, the ease for them to come into a clinic or is it easier for them to have it done at home? What's, how ambulatory are they? That sort of thing. Consult and obtain clearance from a nephrologist. Confirm patient is, oh, this is, now we're talking about types of dialysis and alterations in care. So um, alterations in dental hygiene care for a patient on dialysis. We want to consult and obtain clearance, first of all, from their nephrologist. And then confirm the patient is medically stable enough to receive treatment. Determine if prophylactic antibiotic, antibiotic is necessary. It oftentimes is. Um, do not take blood pressure on the dialysis access arm. One of their arms will have a port or a fistula, um, and you do not take blood pressure on that arm. That's very important. Avoid dental treatment the day of dialysis due to the use of their anticoagulant, um, anticoagulant therapy. Um, so they're going to bleed more, um, and so you want to make sure that if they have dialysis Monday, Wednesday, Friday, that you only do a dental cleaning on a Tuesday or a Thursday. Consider the function of the compromised organ and how malfunction of this organ will affect body systems. So considering, you know, what areas of their body are, is, you know, weakened due to their chronic disease, how is that going to affect their mouth? How's that going to infect infection? How's that going to infect all the different roles? So for example, they're going to be more prone to hypertension and diabetes. That's going to put them at greater risk for periodontal disease, um, maybe xerostomia and decay because of their medications. You know, everything is connected. End stage, so dental hygiene process of care considerations continued. End stage renal disease patients are prone to secondary diabetes and hypertension. Secondary medical conditions are not part of the original etiology of the disease, but rather a complication that develops as a result of the disease, such as things like fluid retention, anemia, hyperparathyroidism, or malnutrition. Um, this is a lot, these next couple slides, there's a lot of information here. Um, these are oral manifestations, sort of the description, and then the dental treatment considerations. So um, these are things that could show up in, in your patient. Um, I'm not going to read off the dental treatment consideration, but I highly encourage you to read through these um, these tables. So pallor of the oral mucosa, this has to do with anemia. Pale appearance of the oral mucosa results from anemia. Xerostomia, dry mouth, reduction in saliva flow results in dry mouth, caries, gingival disease, and viral and fungal infections. Red or orange pigmentation of the cheeks and oral mucosa, this is puritis, severe itching of the skin, Dryness of the skin and um, depositions of carotene-like pigmentation results from a decrease in the renal filtration. Um, um, dis uh, oh gosh, I thought that was dyspenia, but it's not. Dis um, Guizia, altered or metallic taste sensation. Saliva may exhibit a characteristic of like an ammonia-like odor resulting from high urea content. So the patient may complain of a strange taste in their mouth. Um, they've probably known what it is. It's the fact that they are have a higher urea content. But if you notice um, sort of a, a particular odor that doesn't smell like periodontal disease, it doesn't smell like, you know, kind of a GERD stomach upset or just biofilm, It's um, that's what it can be um, stemmed from. Bacterial, viral, and fungal infections. Fungal infections, candida, are more frequent, resulting from reduction or lack of saliva and immunosuppression. Petechiae and ecchymosis and uh, gingival bleeding. Bleeding tendencies observed 
on the oral mucosa, soft palate, border of the tongue, gingiva, resulting from thrombocytopenia, infection, medications use, and use of anticoagulants such as heparin. So the bleeding disorders have a lot to do with medication, um, especially anticoagulant. Dentition abnormalities of the children. Um, enamel hypoplasia, red brownish discoloration of teeth occurs in children, delayed or altered eruption patterns, dental pulps may have appeared narrowed. This is if there's chronic kidney infection or chronic, chronic kidney disease with a child. Dental erosion or lingual surfaces on the um, erosion on the lingual surfaces. Erosion of teeth is associated with weak regurgitation and persistent vomiting from high levels of uremia. So this could be a result of um, a side effect of their end-stage renal disease. Uremic stomat um, uh, st stomatitis. Uh, two forms. There is um, erythropoietic um, type features dry er um, erythematous burning, painful oral mucosa that is covered with a thick gray exudate. exudate. The ulcerative form is characterized by mucosal ulcerate, uh, ulcerations. So ure, ure, uh, uremic stomatitis can um, can appear sort of different, two different ways. Looks very kind of ulcerated or covered with like a thick gray smear. White patches of uremic frost, crystallized or powdered like um, urea deposits that can be found on the skin or oral, mu oral mucosa, resulting from um, excretion of nitrogenous compounds in the sweat observed in severe uremia. Osseous changes of the maxilla and mandible, loss of lamina dura, demineralized bone characterized as ground glass in appearance, and localized radiolucent lesions. Central giant cell granulomas may also appear. Infection or inflammation of the periodontium, periodontal or endodontic abscesses, periodontitis. Periodontal inflammation may be more severe than for normal biofilm-induced gingivitis. Periodontal attachment loss may result from poor oral hygiene, lack of biofilm removal. And then a patient that has chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease has increase in calculus formation. And this is because dental calculus formation arises from uremic status and duration of renal disease. Okay. Okay. So medical considerations for chronic kidney disease patients. There's a greater risk of cardiovascular disease. They almost always have anemia in end stage. Reduction in mass or of circulating red blood cells. Nearly all people living with end stage renal failure have anemia. Oral manifestations of anemia is the pallor of the oral mucosa, glossitis, recurrent aphthia, candidus, um, angular chelitis, and possibly poor oral hygiene due to fatigue. Mineral and bone disorder. Excessive secretion of the parathyroid hormone um, affects this. Kidney loss, ability to excrete phosphorus from the body and produce the active form of vitamin D. So there's usually um, deficiency in vitamin D. Must limit the phosphorus intake because they can't secrete it. Vitamin D supplements and phosphorus binders are recommended. Renal-friendly diet, patients work with a nutritionist um, to because they're on a very strict um, diet when there's end-stage renal or chronic kidney disease. Oral manifestations, calcium deposits um, on and in the teeth, the soft tissue, the vasculature, and our organs. Calcium deposits in the carotid artery may be visible on a panoramic radiograph. Narrowing of the pulp chamber, so that's more calcium deposit within the pulp chamber. Uh, pulp chamber, radio, various radiolucencies, the loss of the lamina, lamina dura, trabecular pattern, and bone density changes. So um, I'm going to read my other notes here. A serious complication of chronic kidney disease characterized by an excessive secretion of parathyroid hormone is known as mineral and bone disorder. 
formerly referred to as secondary hyperparathyroidosis. As renal disease progresses, the kidneys lose their ability to excrete the phosphorus from the body and produce the active form of vitamin D necessary in bone metabolism. Persons with mineral and bone disorders must limit phosphorus intake. In addition, they need vitamin D supplements and a medication known as phosphorus binders may be prescribed to reduce the absorption of phosphorus. Um, nutrition. So renal diet, there's a, re there's a restriction on fluid and the sodium intake that limit the dietary um, phosphorus and potassium. Consult with a, a nutritionist about products that are um, ingested or that are safe for the patient to ingest. Protein levels may be higher or lower depending on their stage of renal disease. Uremia compounds the dental calculus problem. So we already mentioned that, that they may have more calculus because of re uh, uremia. Salivary pH, uremia alters the pH of blood and saliva. Science is unsure if, if uremia is actually protective against dental caries, but we know that it's causing more calculus buildup, so it may increase perio. Xerostomia and fluid restrictions, um, they're going to have dry mouth due to the fluid restrictions, but also due to the medications they could be on. So <clears throat> things like xylitol, frozen grapes, power toothbrush, an oral irrigator, sleeping with a humidifier. These are some recommendations. And then, but consult with the renal dietitian. Um, let's see, I think my notes are all pretty much just a repetition, but as kidney disease progresses, nitrogenous material accumulates in the body, producing a condition known as uremia. So that's, that's what we keep talking about, um, uremia, but that's what it is, an accumulation of nitrogenous, nitrogenous materials. Nearly 50% of adults with chronic kidney disease suffer from dry mouth, which is possibly caused by a restriction in fluid intake, adverse effects of drug therapy, and um, salivary gland hypofunction causing a low salivary flow rate. And mouth breathing is also um, secondary to lung um, perfusion problems. So there's many issues that could um, contribute to a dry mouth. So dental um, professional recommendations. <clears throat> because of the, the, the taste in their mouth um, to help stimulate um, the saliva and to alter that taste, they could have sugar-free candies, um, mechanical stimulation, um, power toothbrush, xylitol containing chewing gums and lozenges, foods such as apples, carrots, and celery are naturally cleansing um, and okay on a renal diet, pharmacological stimulation, drugs that require prescriptions such as um, such as uh, pilocarpine, HCL, or um, Sevimelin HCL. So those um, pharmacological stimulation, huh? I am not quite sure if that has to do with um, um, hypo um, salivation or or xerostomia. I'll have to look that one up. Um, over the cap over the counter um, saliva substitutes. This could be. The pharmacological stimulation could be um, saliva substitutes, I think. We have to, but we have to double check that one. Over the counter so, um, salivary substitutes, chewing on ice chips, and then sleeping with a humidifier. <clears throat> so, um, for considering periodontal disease for the chronic kidney um, disease patient, at best, there's a moderate relationship. Um, that exists between periodontal disease and renal insufficiency. The relationship between the two diseases are still being researched. The risk for periodontal disease appears to be significantly increased in individuals with severe renal disease, which makes sense because so many other, you know, there's so much um, body system being affected. And so, and we know that cardiovascular and diabetes affect perio, so it sort of makes sense that it falls in line. Increased levels of calculus formation on teeth, so that's going to increase their risk for perio. 
patient's noncompliance or improper oral hygiene procedures just because of fatigue or just being overwhelmed or what have you, exaggerated inflammatory response associated with um, alterations in host defense mechanisms because of the immunosuppression. Secondary hypothyroidism can contribute to accelerated bone loss in the presence of periodontal disease. Frequent three to four month continued care intervals appropriate are recommended. The dental hygienist will either coordinate with the primary care physician or the healthcare specialist to determine safe and effective care before and after transplantation. And the last slide here just shows um, uh, the nephrology team. There's the nephrologist, there's a nephrology nurse, there's a renal dietitian, there's a nephrology social worker. They help coordinate all these aspects and transportation and all these things, dialysis, all this stuff. Patient care technician, pre-transplant and post-transplant coordinator. Then there could be the patient's regular physician. They could have a cardiologist if that's something too. I mean... There's so many aspects. It can be so very complicated, and we need to be very um, understanding with our patients that come in. If they are able to get into our chair, we're, you know, we're lucky that they were able to make it that far, and we just want to make sure that um, we provide safe care. And so being aware of all these pieces is, is basically our job. And um, that is, that's renal disease. All right. Thanks, guys.